I'd, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Abhishek Sarkar. Um, I think I first met Abhishek when he was uh, TAing a course I was auditing at um, MIT that Manolis Kals was teaching. Uh, this is some years ago now. Um, Abhishek is now um, at uh, Vesalius Therapeutics in the Computational Biology and Data Sciences Group. Um, and he's going to be telling us about some basic principles that can help clarify confusion in single cell RNA-seq analysis. Um, it's great to have you here, Abhishek. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction, Alex. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, some joint work with Matthew Stevens that we recently published in Nature Genetics. And um, the sort of basic problem that we were trying to address was that the way that people are talking about problems in single cell RNA-seq analysis is very confusing. And that's important to, uh, uh, an important problem to address because the way that people talk about these problems affects the way that they think about these problems. And what we were finding is that uh, many papers, many presentations are uh, doing things that are very confusing and don't make sense because of what they imply about how experiments work or about how biology works. And so our approach was really to think about, well, we need to be very explicit about what is our model of measurement error, which is to say how the experiment works and our model of gene expression, which is how biology works. And this helps everyone to be more explicit about these two aspects and to be, have, really have them be separate and to really be very explicit about both of them. And so I wanna begin actually by this, from this question of, well, how are we talking about these problems? And uh, I wanna point out that uh, many terms that we've been using to describe the data and the models that we fit to that data have been used inappropriately in papers and presentations. Um, I've put a short list here, dropout, missing data, imputation, zero inflation. And when I say that, these terms have been used inappropriately. What I mean is that either they're being used without a single precise unambiguous definition, which is the case for dropout, or they're not being used to mean uh, uh, what they have been established to mean in other fields. For example, missing data, imputation, and zero inflation. And in our paper, we gave some recommendations about, for example, avoiding, simply avoiding the term dropout because it means different things to different people. And uh, it would be better than to have specific terms or just to point out specific aspects of the data that you're interested in describing. So for example, if you're interested in describing the fact that most of the entries in a single cell RNA-seq count matrix are zero, then you might say that the matrix is sparse because this is a term that is already well-defined. That means exactly that most of the entries are zero. But for missing data, imputation, and zero inflation, the issue is a little more subtle um, that there's a conceptual problem also that um, early in the literature, as the first single cell RNA-seq experiments were being done and the data was being analyzed for the first time, what people notice is that there are lots of zeros in these data. And a natural thing or natural question to ask is, well, was there some mechanism in single cell RNA-seq measurement that created these zeros that was different from the mechanism that operated in bulk RNA-seq? And some early papers concluded that there was some evidence suggesting that that was the case. And if that was the case, then one might think that, oh, so if I observe a zero in the data, it's possible that this mechanism created that zero and not biology created that zero. Then I would have to think about missing data and imputation. What we wanna argue in this talk, what we argued in our paper is that there actually, the evidence does not support that view. There are very simple reasons to explain why there are lots of zeros in single cell RNA sequencing data. And there are very simple mechanistic models that we can use to model the measurement error. And to speak to my broader point, 
if we think about now, well, what was the biology that we were measuring and what was the experiment that we did, the way that we propose to think about it is that we have a collection of N cells that we're measuring at P genes. And unobserved are the true gene expression levels of each gene in each of these cells. And we introduce some notation in our paper, which we think is, uh, uh, or some terminology in our paper, which we think is useful. So uh, if we think about what is the actual count of mRNA molecules of each gene in each cell, we call that the absolute gene expression level. And we can also turn that into a fraction, the relative gene expression level. And here in this slide, uh, I'm using MIJ for the absolute expression level and lambda IJ for the relative expression level. Um, and here I should also say that uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about is uh, in units of RNA molecules. And this presupposes that we have done an experiment that used uh, unique molecular identifiers to be able to actually count individual molecules and not double count. And um, this aspect of the experiment actually greatly simplifies many things because then we don't have to worry about gene length or differences in PCR amplification efficiency. And so uh, the results that I'm about to present all presuppose that we've done an experiment with UMIs. They may not apply to experiments with read counts. However, uh, some of the early work in bulk RNA sequencing, like for example, uh, John Marioni and others and Lior Pachter, um, the work that they did addressed actually these problems of differing gene lengths and differing PCR amplification efficiencies in the context of bulk RNA-seq. And I think that some of those ideas also apply to single cell RNA-seq. Abhishek, just quickly, the lambdas are normalized per cell. So the rosoms are one for lambda? That's right. So the idea is that the lambda IJ is the relative expression level of gene J in cell I. And if you sum over all the genes within one cell, that will sum up to one. Okay, so the setup is now that we have these true relative gene expression levels lambda, but we don't get to observe them. What we get to observe is a draw of molecules from this pool of true of the molecules that were present. And this is uh, produces the count matrix whose entries are Xij. Xij is the number of molecules in gene J that we observed in cell I. And some sort of very obvious things that might come to your mind, well, we could do this same normalization on the observed molecules. You could compute what is Xij divided by the sum of the Js of Xij. And that would give you a pretty uh, naive, but maybe still useful estimate of lambda Ij. And so we want to maybe formalize that idea by thinking about, we want to build models about that describe the process that generates the Xs from the lambdas. Then we want to use those models to conclude things about the lambdas having observed the Xs. And this is what we're calling uh, uh, the separation of observation models into expression models and measurement models. So an expression model describes how the lambdas vary either at one gene or across this whole data matrix. And a measurement model describes how are the Xs generated from a particular realization of this matrix of relative gene expression levels, which I'm calling capital lambda. And if I multiply the two uh, using some simple rules of probability, I will get out the generative model for the Xs, the, the observed counts, and we call that an observation model. And we think that this is a really helpful way of thinking about models because it, it makes explicit what are we assuming about biology in the expression model and what are we assuming about the experiment in the measurement model. And this is really important because many papers that have been written up to this point, many papers that are uh, just recently published continue to focus on just the observation model. They, we just write down a complicated model for that describes how the counts were generated without explicitly talking about, well, what was biology and what was the experiment or what was the measurement error? And the problem is then it becomes very difficult to interpret the results, the fits of these models, because you can't go back and say, oh, for example, 
if I included a point mass on zero to capture uh, some belief about how perhaps a gene is not expressed in some of the cells that I measured. If I don't explicitly say that was in the expression model, then it would be possible to conclude actually that I was assuming that there was some kind of zero generating mechanism in the measurement model. And the thing is, the likelihood of the data are equal under these two different scenarios. You can't tell from data which of these is more likely to have generated the data. So then it becomes very, very important to say explicitly, I'm assuming that this point mass reflects this aspect of biology. And I think that that will help both in uh, developing new methods that uh, can produce reasonable biological conclusions, but also in for, for those of who are going to apply these methods and try to interpret the results. I think it will also simplify much of the task of fitting complex models and then interpreting the results and bringing the results back to biology. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on these two aspects, measurement models and expression models. And I'm gonna begin by talking about a simple proposal for a, a, a measurement model that we think applies to many different experimental protocols for performing single cell RNA sequencing. And that we think is a useful simplification that we should all be using as a starting point for developing methods and models for this kind of data. So I wanna begin with some very basic assumptions about the measurement process in single cell RNA-seq. And those assumptions are, first, that each molecule in each cell is equally likely to be observed. Uh, this is uh, ignoring the fact that some molecules came from different genes and genes had different relative expression levels. I'm just talking about I have a pool of, let's say, 1 million RNA molecules. And in the measurement process, I'm gonna go into this pool and pick one of the molecules to observe. And this assumption says that out of all those million molecules that were present in this cell, I'm equally likely to have measured any of them in each sort of round that I'm gonna be drawing one molecule to measure. The second assumption is that each molecule is observed or measured independently of all the other molecules. So. Having observed the first molecule, I go back into the pool and which molecule I pick up next didn't matter on any of the molecules that I picked so far or any of the molecules that are left in the pool. And the third assumption is that only a small proportion of all the molecules present are observed. So I'm not going to draw all 1 million of these molecules. I'm only gonna draw, let's say order of magnitude 10,000 in a typical experiment. And that this is a small fraction of the total pool that I could have drawn from. So these are relatively weak assumptions, except for the first one. And uh, I'll say in a moment what happens when these assumptions don't hold. But if we take, if we start from just these simple, not very strong assumptions about how the measurement process works, then immediately we get out a single measurement model. And the measurement model can be written in two ways, which are equivalent. The first one says that I've collected uh, Xi1 molecules from gene one all the way up to Xip molecules from gene P. And in total, I've collected Xi plus molecules from a pool of RNA molecules in this cell I, of which lambda I1 fraction come from gene one and lambda IP fraction come from gene P. And that is exactly described by multinomial distribution. And the multinomial distribution is also equivalent to a product of a, a multinomial distribution over P. Uh, groups or P categories is exactly equivalent up to a constant of the likelihood uh, to a product of P Poisson distributions. And the full details of why we need all these assumptions in order to get here are in the supplement of our paper. But the intuition is that, okay, we're going into a pool of molecules and we're going to be taking draws from that pool of molecules. And this is our proposal for the starting point of uh, methods development for single cell RNA sequencing data. Because this is a measurement model that is grounded in assumptions and some evidence about how the measurement process actually works. Uh, so one key feature that is missing from this measurement model is a zero generating mechanism in addition to Poisson sampling. And 
we show some empirical evidence and others have shown empirical evidence, for example, Valentine Svensson, uh, Jing Shu Wang and others, in, and that actually the data don't support that there is some kind of mechanism in the measurement process that generates additional zeros. So we argue that this Poisson uh, measurement model specifically is a very attractive starting point for methods development because inference in the models that you get out is relatively straightforward or at least not extremely difficult as is the case for the multinomial distribution. All right, so what are the consequences of this measurement model on the kinds of terminology problems that I was started by pointing out? So first, if we take this measurement model as a uh, relatively accurate description of the measurement process, then there is a simple reason that there are lots of zeros in, bulk, in single cell RNA-seq and many more zeros than appeared in bulk RNA-seq. And the reason is that this rate parameter of the Poisson, Xi plus times lambda Ij, is often smaller in single cells than in bulk. And there's two reasons for that. One of them is that in bulk, this quantity Xi plus, the total number of molecules that we observed is much bigger. And bulk data can be thought of as an average of single cells. And averaging reduces the variance of the relative expression levels. So you think about, okay, I took a population of cells in which lambda Ij varies a lot, and I took an average of it. And that's another reason so that lambda Ij can be smaller in single cells than they could be in bulk samples. Uh, as I was mentioning in the previous slide, there's not an extra zero generating mechanism. It's simply the case that all of the zeros that we observed and all of the ones and twos and every other observation are noisy observations of the true gene expression level lambda. And here, noisy specifically means Poisson noise. Related to that, we don't need special terms or special treatment of zeros in the measurement model. That's not to say that we don't need special treatment of zeros or very low expression levels in the expression model, but specifically that there is no extra mechanism that generates zeros in the measurement process. That also means that we don't need a term like dropout to talk about some kind of supposed mechanism. Related to that, there is no missing data in a single cell RNA sequencing count matrix. A zero is, as I just said, a noisy observation of a true gene expression level that one might reasonably conclude is very low. What that means is that methods that claim to impute only zeros should be avoided. Um, and this is another case where actually the terminology is a little bit imprecise and, and uh, so we should talk a little bit, I'd say briefly about imputation. So imputation refers to filling in unobserved data. And the, the rationale for methods that impute only zeros is that the zeros could be missing data. We need to fill in those data entries or infer what they were given all of the observed entries. And what we argue based on this measurement model, based on these simple assumptions is that that's not actually a, a reasonable assumption uh, that, that zeros are missing data and that we need to actually try to fill them in. But there's another way of, uh, of thinking about imputation in this context, because we don't get to observe the true gene expression levels, lambda. And you could reasonably say that one goal that a method might try to accomplish is to estimate lambda given x. And strictly speaking, that is an imputation. We did not observe lambda, so we're going to try and estimate lambda given x. Um, it's, I think it's unclear, should we use imputation for that, that particular task, or should we use a term like denoising, uh, which others have used. But uh, that particular task, which is estimate lambda given x, we think is a very important task to be able to solve. And so methods that do that do uh, have statistical principle behind them. And there are interesting questions that you could ask about, for example, supposing that you produced an estimate of lambda given x, could you then just fit models to lambda in a kind of modular process where 
you first fit a model that estimates these lambdas, and then maybe the lambdas have nicer properties than counts. They might be amenable to models that are easier to fit than count models. So that's an interesting open question. All right, so I wanna return now to those assumptions that I started with, uh, because some of you may be thinking, well, some of those assumptions might not hold in real data or in real experiments. So I wanna talk about what happens when those assumptions don't hold. And especially the first one, the first assumption said that each molecule in the cell is equally likely to be measured. And there are many reasons why that might not be true. Uh, the actual process of cell preparation, library preparation and so on, uh, is particularly stressful to RNA molecules and different RNA molecules have different chances of surviving all of these different processes to make it to be measured. Um, the RNA secondary structure might matter, where they were localized in the cell might matter, and so on. The sequence content might matter. And so there are lots of reasons we know of that that first assumption might not hold. So the question is what happens uh, when molecules are not equally likely to be observed? And so we started from a pretty basic assumption, which is suppose that the probability that we observed a particular molecule from gene J in cell I depends on a bias term also. So there's the Bij that is proportional to this probability, and it depends also on Mij, how many molecules were there. And the, the sort of model we're thinking of here is you keep going into this pool of molecules and trying to measure something until you succeed. And then you succeed with probability proportional to this Bij and proportional to how many molecules of gene J were there. All right, so with some basic algebra, what you can show is that uh, this ratio, we can always scale the Bij's. So you can always scale the denominator so that the denominator is the sum of all the molecules present. And then what you'll get is that this probability that you measured molecule, a molecule from cell I in gene J is Bij multiplied by lambda Ij. And then what we have is the same situation as before. We're going into a pool of molecules and drawing out of p different categories, except that now the probability I get a particular molecule from gene J is not just lambda Ij, it's Bij times lambda Ij. So actually the whole argument that got us to the multinomial or the Poisson measurement model still applies. It's just that there's this extra term, Bij. Okay, so now one obvious question to ask is, well, how do you estimate Bij from the data? Well, you need to make some assumptions. And one assumption you might make uh, is that there's some kind of log linear effect of covariates that you've measured in the experiment, uh, and those are exactly equal to the Bij. Now, one point here is that uh, model any model you write down is probably incomplete. And so the way that we conceptualize that is that, well, suppose that you didn't do this, suppose that you didn't assume that there was some kind of specific parametric model that you're gonna estimate about these Bij's, then, then what would happen? Well, if the Bij's are constant over all of the cells, then you can actually safely ignore them at a single gene. If you're just gonna compare lambda 1j against lambda 2j or some kind of function of the means, in two groups. And the reason is that, well, you've multiplied all the lambdas by a constant, but then you're dividing, and so the constant cancels. So the trickier case is what happens if these Bij's vary from cell to cell. Then the randomness uh, or the variation in the Bij's will cause the, the measurement error to actually be over dispersed. And one way to think about that is suppose that I don't know what the Bij's are in each of the cells, but I'm going to assume that they have some mean one and some variance. And uh, for convenience, let me just assume that they follow a gamma distribution with mean one and variance theta, let's say. Uh, if I then integrate out the Bij's, I will get out a negative binomial measurement model with dispersion one over theta. And one question you might ask is, well, well, we know that there are such biases in this measurement process, measure, biases that we haven't accounted for, possibly can't account for using the observed technical covariates that we have access to. Do we need to be worrying about a negative binomial measurement model? And the answer is in principle, yes, but 
there's great difficulty in fitting a negative binomial measure mo measurement model in addition to a expression model of choice that reflects what you assume about biology. And specifically, the problem is that it's not possible to say from data whether the variation you see came from the measurement process or from the expression process or the biological processes that you're studying. And the reason is that statistically that model is not identifiable. You could put the variance in the measurement process or you could put the variance in the expression model and the likelihood would be the same. One of the th analyses that we did in our paper was actually to look at control data and try to assess how big could that variance explained by uh, unmodeled sources of technical variation, unmodeled sources of measurement error B. And what we showed in our paper is that the data are unlikely to have been generated under a model where these biases were very large. So we were, the details of the analysis are a little bit complicated, they're in our paper. But in essence, what we found is that the, the, we tried to fit a model, a negative binomial measurement model in which we assumed that the uh, level of measurement error was constant across all genes. And then what we found is that the data are very unlikely to have been generated, the control data, which is consists of spiking in RNA molecules at known concentrations into droplets and then sequencing those droplets. But what we found is that those data are unlikely to have been generated from a, uh, a measurement model in which the level of dispersion or the level of measurement error that was unaccounted for was very high. So this gives us some confidence that actually we can go ahead and, and simplify uh, at least that aspect of, of the measurement model. So if you're doing 10x genomics, if you're doing drop seek, we have some confidence and some empirical evidence that suggests that the variation due to the actual apparatus itself is unlikely to add much variance to your data. So that we think we're arguing that it's a useful simplification to just say the measurement process here is Poisson still. And um, okay, so that covers what happens if molecules are not equally likely to be observed. Okay, so the next question is, well, what happens if molecules are not sampled independently? And what are some of the reasons that this could happen? Uh, one example might be the cellular localization of mRNAs. Um, this case is quite complicated, but the essence of it is that this will also lead to overdispersion. And similar to the previous case, uh, without making additional assumptions, it's not possible to separate these sources of measurement error from biological variation of the data. And so it's an important open question then, well, what are reasonable assumptions to make about this kind of more complicated process? And the last assumption was that we sample a small fraction of all the molecules that are present. And uh, one case where that violation may not hold in real data is for example, in prokaryotic cells. So in prokaryotic cells, RNA counts are much lower and it is in principle possible actually to capture and sequence every RNA molecule in a cell. So this is sort of the other extreme where we've got almost everything in the cell. So the question is, well, what happens to this measurement model or what does this measurement model say possibly incorrectly about the data? And to illustrate what, uh, what the consequences of that are, uh, let's think about one G and J, and suppose that we saw a Q fraction of all the molecules in a particular cell, I. And you can think about what are the kinds of measurement models we might assume about this data. So the, we might assume the Poisson, uh, which comes from this multinomial. We might assume a binomial distribution, uh, which would be um, sampling uh, without replacement. Uh, or a hypergeometric distribution. And these are three different possibilities that all have the same mean, uh, MI plus the total number of molecules multiplied by uh, MI, sorry, MIJ divided by MI plus, so lambda IJ multiplied by Q, but they have different variances. And um, as the number of, the fraction of molecules that we observe becomes very high, then we really do need to account for the fact that 
as we're taking molecules out, the relative fraction of molecules that are left in the pool is changing substantially. We really do need to model the fact that we're sampling without replacement. And so if you look at the, the line, uh, the hypergeometric measurement models that we've written down, and you ask, well, what is its variance? Well, it looks a little bit complicated, but we can make some assumptions. Uh, for example, that MIJ, the number of molecules from gene J is much less than MI plus, the total number of molecules. So then um, this, the ratio MI plus minus MIJ over MI plus is close to one. And similarly, we might assume that MI plus is much bigger than one. That's a safe assumption, in which case the second ratio is also close to one. So then the difference between a hypergeometric measurement model and a Poisson measurement model is this term one minus Q. And as Q becomes really big, that becomes very different from one. And the consequence is that as the fraction of molecules that we observe, which is Q becomes large, then the Poisson measurement model will overstate the variance in the data due to measurement error. And there's a complicated open question, which is, well, how large does Q have to get before this becomes a problem? Uh, one of the things that we speculated about in our paper is that as Q becomes larger, as our technology becomes more and more capable of observing more and more of the molecules present, actually this uh, problem of overstating the variance of measurement error may end up uh, actually overshadowing the previous problems of not accounting for some of the biases in the measurement process. So it's an, another important question that isn't answered yet, which is uh, what is the relative, relative importance of these two different sort of, in one case, overstating, in the other case, understating the level of measurement error in the data. All right, so to summarize, we proposed a Poisson measurement model that has strong theoretical support, not just uh, our own theoretical arguments, but also arguments of Towns and others, Wang and others, Svensson. Uh, so several papers all show, all pointing in that this is a uh, useful and, and relatively accurate way of describing the measurement process in single cell RNA sequencing. Um, as I've gone through in the talk, as we go through in the paper in more detail, this is a simplification. It's necessarily a simplification, but we argue it's a useful simplification. And uh, one of the things that we argue is that having decided now that this is a Poisson, uh, we're going to use a Poisson measurement model to model single cell RNA sequencing data, we should be focusing our attention on expression models. We should be focusing our attention on what are we assuming about biological processes or the biology of the systems that we're studying. And those should actually be the driving factors for how we develop methods and how we choose between which methods we apply for any particular data set, rather than focusing on, are we accounting for zeros properly? These kinds of questions. All right, so now I'm in my, uh, I wanna just briefly review some expression models. And here, I'm not gonna be making recommendation models, uh, recommendations of, for example, you should use this expression model over that expression model because uh, expression models, as I've been saying several times now, they are encoding assumptions about biology. And so the way to choose which expression model you should be applying to solve a particular problem has to account for what are you assuming about biology? And it also has to account for what are you hoping to learn from that biology? Or what are you hoping to learn from your experiment? So, we sort of divided expression models into two big categories. One of them applies to single genes and one of them applies to all genes simultaneously. Um, so let me begin with just models for single genes. So what might you do with a model for a single gene? You might assess differential expression. You might assess differential variance. You might try to fit EQTLs or other kinds of QTLs to the distribution of gene expression at a particular gene. And these would require you to first estimate some aspect of that distribution. And so what we propose is that, well, a single gene expression model, as we called it, is a distributional assumption on the lambda ijs. Uh, this is a simplification too. You could imagine uh, I would want uh, one of these distributions for each of say 10 different cell types in my experiment, but 
let's just think about, okay, I have a population of cells that I think it makes sense to treat as a unit and to fit a single distribution to. We're gonna call that distribution GJ, indexed by gene J. And what are the kind, what are the statistical problems that we need to do uh, having written down this model? We need to estimate G from the data and we need to estimate lambda or some function of lambda given the estimates of G and the observed data. So I wanna begin with the sort of simplest expression models, the ones probably people are familiar with, even if they haven't seen them uh, explicitly written down in this way. So I wanna begin with a gamma, or sorry, a point mass expression model. So a point mass is a single value. So- uh, Sorry, think, sorry I would check, I, yes. I have a question. Um, so going back to the last slide, you're looking at one gene at a time now, but you're still normalizing across cells. I'm a bit confused about that now. Um, we're normalizing within a cell, not across. Sorry, you're, this, uh, that's what I meant to say. You're normalizing yeah. across gene. I meant to say you're normalizing across genes, but you're only considering right. one gene at a time. What are you What are you modeling right now? When you say single gene, is GJ a vector over J? Or are you fixing J? I, I'm just not quite following. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So this would be lambda i J over J. So the observations at a single gene. So this would be one column of the count matrix. They follow a distribution, GJ. Right. And yeah, there are quite a few assumptions that go into this. Um, are you, uh, by looking at lambdas instead of the, the original counts, aren't you kind of convolving uh, with, with whatever variability there is in the cell type totals as well? The, sorry, the cell totals as well? Um, yes. So yeah, there's some complications here. One of the complications is that if there is some other gene that has highly variable expression, that too will affect lambda. Yeah, and that's, I, guess, I guess that's what I was getting at. I guess, I guess if there's a lot of genes and they're not that variable, then there's a kind of law of large numbers thing that says you don't have to worry about that, but. Yeah, so the issue is suppose that there was some gene that was highly expressed in some of the samples, yeah. in some of the cells and not expressed in others. Then, then and, that would make lambdas, then that would make the distribution of lambda a little bit different from that of the, the there would be th that that would that would be wrapped into lambda and in addition to just the the overall counts m that you had before right yeah so so this is an issue that um to my knowledge has been basically swept under the rug because this issue actually also applies to bulk rna seq it applies to differential expression in bulk rna seq that if there is so if i have a bulk rna seq sample which uh, one thing i failed to mention is that actually our view of single cell rna seq is actually exactly the same as our view of bulk RNA seq. The two are not different from a measurement standpoint. So if you think about, okay, I have variation in, suppose, suppose that gene two is differentially expressed in, in two groups of samples. That, because, because the lambdas are relative expression levels, that will induce differential expression everywhere else in the transcriptome. And this is an issue that, to my knowledge, has not been sufficiently addressed in the literature either. But um, regardless, we have been able to get useful insights from doing these kinds of single gene analyses in the bulk context and in the single cell context. So I wanna focus here simply on, well, if we take that we can get useful results out of this kind of analysis, how should we be doing this kind of analysis? Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I want to begin from the simplest possible model, which is actually that there's no variation among samples. And uh, there are two ways to think about that, either that lambda is equal to a particular value mu, or that log lambda is equal to a particular value theta. And you can compute analytically what is the, what is the optimal, the maximum likely estimate of these parameters. And what you'll notice is that in the case of the log lambda equals theta, you will get out an expression for theta hat that looks like the usual pseudo bulk data up to a pseudo count. So this is the justification for doing pseudo bulk analysis. You're making an assumption that there's no variation uh, in relative expression levels for, between cells in your group of samples that you're going to collapse together into a single distribution and you're just going to estimate that distribution from the data. 
And surprisingly, uh, we have some preliminary results. Uh, Mengyan Liu, who was uh, Matthew's PhD student, and published in her PhD thesis some preliminary results showing that actually even making this kind of really, really strong assumption that is definitely not true in real data still allows you to get reasonable estimates of the mean gene expression. So, okay, this is an overly strong assumption that there's no variation at all. So how might you introduce the possibility of some biological variation? Simplest uh, distribution you could use here is a gamma distribution. Um, one thing to say about the gamma distribution is that it's largely chosen because it's conjugate to the Poisson. It's largely chosen because doing inference in this kind of an observation model is relatively straightforward. It still requires numerical methods, but those numerical methods are easy to implement. And we actually have lots and lots of literature on doing these kinds of inference problems quickly. Um, one other point is that because it's conjugate, the posterior lambda ij given the data and given the estimate is also analytic and that's also highly convenient. Um, for example, the method saver uses this kind of idea to estimate lambda given the observed data. Um, similar kinds of things hold for a mixture of a point mass on zero and a gamma distribution. Um, why might you do this? This kind of an expression model encodes an assumption that, well, in some of the cells you're looking at, the gene is not expressed at all. You could imagine that this is actually an overly strong assumption and you might want rather than a point mass on zero, which I'm calling delta zero here, you might want a distribution that has lots of mass close to zero. So some kind of distribution that's unimodal on zero, but doesn't have many large values. And that would be a different expression model that would capture a different assumption about biology. Um, but for this uh, expression model, um, inference is still convenient. Um, we still have a large history of numerical methods to fit these kinds of models to count data. But one important point about interpretation now is that the mean gene expression in this model is one minus pi, one minus the fraction on zero, multiplied by mu, the mean of the non-zero portion. And this is very important to keep in mind because if you combine this point gamma expression model with a Poisson measurement model, what you will get out is a zero inflated negative binomial observation model. And in the literature, there have been several zero inflated negative binomial observation models proposed to analyze the data. However, it matters a great deal where you put this point mass on zero. And we go through this in more detail in our paper. But as I mentioned previously, you can't tell from data, does this point mass go in the measurement model or does this point mass go in the expression model? Because the likelihood is equal in either case. So you have to begin from an assumption. And we argue that the correct assumption is that the measurement model is Poisson and a point mass on zero goes in the expression model. And the consequence of that is that the mean gene expression, which is the expected value of lambda ij, is now one minus pi times mu and not just mu. And similarly, the variance is not the variance of the gamma component, it's the variance of this two component mixture, which is more complicated. And I've written on the slide. Um, and these are important points to keep in mind when using this kind of a model to do things like estimate the mean and variance of gene expression. And for example, in my own work where we wanted to study uh, genetic effects on the variance of gene expression, it was very important to get the variance of gene expression correct and to use the expression on this slide. Um, one last point is that the posterior again is analytic under this simple expression model. That's less true or not true for more, com more complicated models. Um, we also considered in our paper, uh, much more flexible models, uh, semi-parametric models. So the first one was a semi a sort of discretization of, the, of all possible unimodal distributions. And the idea is that uh, if you use a mixture of half uniform segments, that are centered at some mode lambda zero, you can capture any unimodal distribution with mode lambda zero. And uh, some technical details, if you fix the lambda zero, then the likelihood of the data as a function of the pies, which is the only things left to estimate in this model, 
uh, is convex. And in fact, that problem can be solved by the adaptive shrinkage package. Uh, it can be solved using, um, it's a linear, uh, a convex optimization and it is solved efficiently um, inside of our adaptive shrinkage package, which supports Poisson measurement models. And it's using an algorithm called uh, mix SQP. So you can, what we do actually is we, we solve this kind of subproblem of the convex optimization, and then we do an outer optimization of the lambda zero. So actually you don't need to know where the mode was in order to use this method. We actually estimate where the mode was too. Um, necessarily this method is slower. It takes more time to fit the data because it's doing a much more complicated inference procedure. And actually we also considered a fully non-parametric expression model, which would be in essence, trying to represent the space of all distributions uh, on non-negative reals. So the way we do that is uh, we use uniform segments that, grid, that are in a grid over a range of the data. And it turns out that this can also be solved by the adaptive shrinkage package. And in our paper, we did some empirical experiments trying to compare um, in real data and in synthetic mixtures of sorted cells. Uh, do the data support, for example, that one needs a, a point mass on zero to explain biological variation? Uh, does one need this fully non-parametric expression model to capture multimodal or much more complicated uh, distributions of expression? And some of the surprising things we found, you can see in our paper, is that for many genes, a gamma expression model is fine. However, there are many genes for which it's not fine. And for the genes in which a gamma distribution is inadequate to capture biological variation, it turns out that actually um, it's not because there was a mode on zero, but because actually the variance was much larger or there was a long tail that can't be captured by a gamma. All right, so I'm going a little bit over time. So I'll just very briefly say something we're, about- We're actually, we're actually okay. Um, we, we, can, we can go for five more minutes. It's, it's um, there's a, we, we sort of build in a buffer, you know? Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll now move to multi-gene expression models and everything becomes more complicated here. So I'm just gonna talk about the assumptions. What are the kinds of assumptions that are being made when you decide to apply one of these uh, methods to, uh, to your data? So the, the simplest case is, possibly the simplest case, is what we're calling Poisson NMF, um, as distinguished from Gaussian NMF or, or Frobenius norm NMF. And Peter will talk in more detail about this model. Uh, but the essence of the model is that now, if I look at that matrix, the whole matrix of relative gene expression levels lambda, I'm gonna make a low rank assumption that it's the product of a loadings matrix L and a factors matrix F. And I'm gonna try and estimate L and F from the data. And um, lambda needs to be non-negative. So I need to introduce non-negativity constraints on L and F. And this is well studied. Uh, you can see the references in the bottom of the slide. And, and Peter will talk in more detail about how this Poisson NMF model is closely connected to what we are calling the multinomial topic model. And that in turn is related to methods you may be familiar with like latent Dirichlet allocation, uh, probabilistic latent semantic indexing. Um, another natural choice, so you, you might model that the matrix lambda, matrix of lambda is low rank or that the matrix of log lambda is low rank. And if you write down that log lambda is low rank, you will get out the method GLMPCA uh, where there are some recent publications. And so these kinds of assumptions basically say there are structures uh, in the data. Um, you can think of them as cell types or cell states or possibly uh, gene expression modules that are described by the factors. And then the relative expression levels that I see in the cells are some kind of sum uh, as specified by the loadings. So sums of these different uh, gene expression modules or mixtures, if you want to think of it that way, mixtures of different cell states. Um, the next one, one ad additional thing that you might want to include in your assumptions about this matrix lambda is that there's some noise in it. So there are departures from these structures. And we wrote down a relatively general scheme for doing this in our paper, where 
Um, there is a structured component, which we're calling mu ij or a matrix mu, and an unstructured component, which we're calling nu ij. And the idea is that the structured component has this low rank structure. So the matrix mu ij or the matrix is some link function h of mu ij is LF transpose, and the noise follows some distribution. Here I've written gamma, uh, gamma distributions, as I've mentioned before, make inference uh, more straightforward because you can analytically integrate them out. Um, some examples of methods that do this, uh, NBMF, negative binomial matrix factorization, or SCNBMF, a particular implementation that is specialized for single cell data. They make different choices about this identity function. They also make different choices about the parameterization of this noise. And so um, there are lots of choices that one could make here, modeling choices, what is H? How are we parameterizing the gamma? And these all are all reflecting assumptions about biology. And that means that there's no one recommendation that we could make. You should do it this way or you should do it that way. You need to think about what are the sources that you think are in the data that you are analyzing and how do you write them down explicitly in your model and then fit that model. And I just want to say briefly that you could actually do something a little bit more general than this which is to take that linear mapping LF transpose and turn it into a nonlinear mapping, uh, which is some function F. And there are recently neural network-based methods, SCBI, DCA, um, SC arches, these kinds of methods that are trying to do inference by learning F and learning these Ls, the loadings, or the latent space uh, simultaneously from the data. And these are also in an area of where there's lots of room for methods development, lots of room for thinking very carefully about what is this model that we're writing down implying about what we're assuming about biology and how can we go the other way? How can we make assumptions about biology and then encode them into these kinds of models? What is, what that, was L here? How, how, how does this specialize to what you were doing before? So the Ls, you can think of them as the loadings of the cells on the factors. And so uh, the way to think about it is that a, a neural network takes um, this, well, what, the way to think about it is that the, the decoder network, the one that takes an L and produces the mu, it takes this latent dimension and then does something to it to produce the mu. And here, what, it, what we did is we took that vector L and we multiplied it by the matrix F transpose. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and so in the neural network, it would be multiplying by the matrix F transpose, applying a nonlinearity, adding a bias, and sure. possibly doing that recursively, right? So here, here the structure is low dimensional, but not necessarily low rank in some sense. Yeah, it's not necessarily, well, it's it's difficult to say, is it low rank or not? Well, the embedding isn't linear, is, is what you're saying, so. Exactly, the, yeah. the embedding is nonlinear, we're we are still mapping data points into a low dimensional space. We were, we're taking x i dot that vector mm -hmm. and mapping it to a low dimensional vector l i dot. Still, we were doing that even in the linear low rank case, but now the mapping is not. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So to conclude, um, what I've uh, argued in this talk is that models for the observed single cell RNA seq counts can be helpfully separated into measurement models and expression models. And the reason to do this is to make explicit your assumptions about measurement error and, make, and about uh, gene expression or about biology. What we argued is that theory and empirical evidence point to the Poisson measurement model as being a good starting point for methods development. A, it's a simplification, but it's a useful simplification. And we argue that all, all people, both uh, researchers who are developing methods, researchers who are applying methods, should be explicit about what assumptions they're making about biology and then pick methods that reflect those assumptions or pick models that reflect those assumptions or in the case of developers, develop models that reflect those assumptions. And uh, I just in a little sort of world review, you can see more in our paper, many existing methods that have been published for single cell RNA-seq analysis are combining different expression models with this Poisson measurement model. And this too gives some insight into how should one pick which method you, to use for a particular problem. All right, so I, I'd just like to acknowledge um, 
uh, my collaborators, Matthew Stevens, uh, Mengen Liu, Peter Carbonetto, who helped on this work. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'm and I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce Peter Carbonetto to give the second talk. Um, Peter uh, joining us from the University of Chicago. Um, Peter, go ahead. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm just mindful of people being in different contexts here listening to this talk. So uh, I shared with you the, uh, the URL, the link to the slides that I'll be presenting for the next uh, little bit. And uh, so if you want to flip through the slides or you know you have to go away for a few minutes, uh, feel free to uh, download those slides. And I'll leave that up for a minute uh, while you type in that link. Um, so for, and for those of you who will be here with me uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll make sure to leave time for questions so you can ask questions uh, about this and uh, Abhishek's talk. Uh, the goal is, is a very simple one. It's to uh, share with you some findings that we uh, share with you uh, our results on uh, using the topic model to analyze uh, single cell data, uh, specifically single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so, uh, so we're focusing in, instead on a specific model, the topic model. And uh, just to set expectations here, um, the, uh, we're going to be using, uh, we're not going to be using TSNI, we're not going to be using UMAT to, uh, uh, to show some nice plots. Instead, we're going to be using the topic model. So this, uh, this talk may be a bit unusual in that sense. There's no TSNI plots and there's no UMAT plots. Um, so uh, now for those of you who maybe are not interested in single cell data, and maybe there's a few of you, who have different types of data that you're interested in. Uh, my hope is that you might also find this interesting because uh, this, uh, this, the process of, of using the topic model for single cell data has motivated us, motivated us to rethink uh, some basic aspects of the topic model. Uh, and so I'll present those as well. And so maybe that will make you think about uh, applying the topic model to, to your particular data. Uh, Alex, I, I can't see the chat window. Um, I don't know. If oh yeah, no, no, uh, it's, it's not, you don't have to monitor the chat window. So, okay. you know, if, 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 Abhishek, if you see a question that you think you can answer, go ahead. And uh, if I see something and I see a good time to interrupt you, I will, but you don't have to look at it. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, I see. That was just a couple of messages about my camera not being well aligned. Okay. So, um, right. It's not advancing. There we go. Okay, so uh, I, I'm the topic model, uh, informally the topic model, more precisely the uh, the model that was introduced uh, in in a couple papers uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, often known as uh, uh, probabilistic latent semantic indexing or uh, the latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, but informally known as a topic model, it's, it's a very popular topic model and it's quite important in machine learning. But uh, you may have not had the chance to learn about the topic model, so I'm going to take a few slides just to give some intuition for it and, uh, and give some formal details about the topic model. Uh, so this is a, a diagram that uh, was highlighted in a paper by Michael Jordan and Tom Mitchell in Science, and uh, I think uh, it may be originally from a paper by David Bly, um, but I, I really like this picture because it gives some intuition for uh, the key features of the talk model. Uh, so one of the key features is that each word gets its own topic, uh, and that's represented by these different colors. So that, and then the second key feature is that uh, the, top, uh, the document then is uh, represented uh, by a mixture of topics. Although uh, I hesitate to use the word mixture because mixture can mean other things, uh, particularly in probability modeling. So perhaps it's more correct to think about this as uh, uh, what's sometimes called a grade of membership uh, model, where uh, rather than being member to a single group or a single cluster, uh, we have partial memberships to multiple groups or multiple clusters. And in, in this context, uh, we call them topics. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit of intuition. 
So uh, more formally now, uh, we can think about this as a procedure for generating uh, the words and documents. And uh, which uh, I also find quite intuitively appealing and hopefully you do too. Um, so uh, the notation here, just to warn you, may be a little bit unfamiliar to you. We're using slightly different notation uh, in this context, uh, but uh, the actual uh, description here is straight out of uh, the early papers on topic modeling. And so the idea is that we have a collection of documents, a uh, total of n documents here, uh, and I'll index, throughout the talk, I'll index documents by I, and uh, each document, uh, there's uh, total length of the document we'll call SI. And, uh, and then what we do is proceed to generate the words in the document uh, from one to SI. And so it starts by choosing a topic and each uh, topic is generated with a certain probability L I K. And, uh, and then once we have the topic, then we can draw, uh, choose a term in our vocabulary and, and the key here is that uh, the uh, probability of choosing a term is different for each topic. And so we're gonna use F, uh, J, K to denote the probability that term J is generated from topic K. And then we're gonna store the words in, the, in our data set. Okay, so that's, uh, that's about as, the simplest description of the topic model that you can get. Uh, it's simple, but it's also, uh, you know, it's, this is sufficient for describing the topic model. All right, so uh, just to, to connect, now to connect this to, uh, to what Abhishek was talking about earlier, we can also think about the topic model as uh, describing both a measurement model uh, and uh, an expression model. And so the, uh, the measurement model really isn't any different from what Abhishek was showing you earlier. We're gonna use the multinomial uh, uh, measurement model, uh, which is closely related to the Poisson. But sometimes, usually people prefer the Poisson because it's uh, just easier to work with uh, numerically to implement in R or Python. And then an expression model uh, that's uh, represented as a linear combination of these L's and F's. And so one thing that makes uh, this expression model maybe a little bit unusual, uh, at least compared to other models you might be working with, is that the expression will be different for every cell and for every gene. Okay, uh, and, and just to point out here, I'm using lambdas here for the uh, multinomial probabilities. Uh, not to be confused with uh, Poisson rate. Hopefully that doesn't cause confusion. Okay. Uh, okay. So just to calibrate expectations here, let's. Um, oh, I don't have the time in front of me. Um, that's my phone. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I have time. Okay. We're doing okay for time. Okay. So uh, yeah, just to calibrate expectations here, um, let's uh, let's apply the topic model to a um, uh, to a a text data set. This is actually a data set that uh, has been around for a while. And it's, it's been around so long, actually, that you may not be aware of, some of you may not know what a news group is. I was looking at this slide just this morning, and I noticed that uh, news groups may not be a familiar idea, but uh, just think about it like a, a topic on Reddit. Um, so the idea is that uh, people posted it to these news groups or Reddit topics, and, uh, and, and the the posts are the documents. Okay, so uh, we're gonna analyze this data set uh, using the topic model. We have, um, uh, we're gonna assume 10 topics. And uh, one uh, feature of this, um, or one way to think about this data set is it's just a sparse counts matrix uh, where we have rows are the documents and the columns are the words or the vocabulary terms. In fact, it's very sparse, only uh, less than 1% of the, the entries in our matrix are non-zero. Okay, so, uh, so one thing here is I'm, I'm, I'm uh, presenting the re results of fitting this topic model in kind of an unusual way. 
or at least unusual if you're, uh, you know, if you're more in machine learning. And, and this is something called the structure plot. And it comes out of, uh, I guess the original idea of the structure plot comes from uh, population genetics, where typically the, the groups might be ancestral populations or reported an ethnicity. And, and we're interested in connecting the self-reported ethnicity or the populations with, uh, with the topics that we've discovered uh, by fitting the topic model. Uh, or I guess in population genetics, uh, it wouldn't be the top topic model. Usually it would be uh, the model called structure or sometimes people call it admixture. Okay, so it's, it's simply a bar chart where uh, each bar represents a document. Uh, and, and then we're, we're stacking up the bars with different colors according to their topic proportion. Okay, uh, yeah, if you have questions about uh, these, let me know because we're gonna see these, uh, these sorts of visualizations quite a bit. In, uh, in population genetics, I've often seen them ordered maybe lexicographically so you sort of see these smooth curves uh, within each one. Uh, how are you ordering uh, the individual uh, ones within each box here? Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, that's actually something, uh, it's a subtle point uh, that uh, I'm glad you brought up because I wasn't going to explicitly mention it. So um, uh, that's a tricky question when it comes to these visualizations uh, because uh, you, you know, often the group, often there's a lot of stuff going on within a group. And so there's a question about how do you order the, the documents so that you kind of you see the, the structure that's within that group. So we actually uh, ran, um, in this case, we actually ran TSNI on each group. So it's a one-dimensional TSNI. And, oh, and we found that to be very effective. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and actually it's, to, it's tricky. Sometimes getting this right is the difference between uh, making it an effective structure plot versus not a very effective one. In terms of seeing a pattern? Like just having in terms a of seeing, yeah, in terms of seeing the interesting uh, patterns. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool. I'm glad I asked. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, uh, right. So so one thing to point out here uh, that in this is that uh, if you look carefully, you may have to squint to see the, the the labels here, but you can see that topics are picking up things that align quite well with the news groups. Uh, to take sort of an obvious example here. Uh, the, the light purple topic is baseball and hockey, so that might represent sports. Uh, but you, you, know, you see some other complex examples. Um, one thing that isn't really quite clear what it could be is this light blue topic that you see um, uh, is capturing the, uh, the words in almost all documents. And we're actually gonna learn later on what that blue topic is. Um, but one thing you know, that uh, an important theme with this topic modeling is or important question is are these topics actually picking up picking up uh, meaningfully uh, or meaningful uh, entities? Are these individually meaningful? And uh, and so that's an important question as we move to single cell data. Okay, so so now we're going to do the exact same thing pretty much, except uh, the data are different. Now instead of having uh, word counts, we have UMI counts, uh, unique molecular identifiers. Uh, so this is an uh, analysis, actually, that, uh, that I didn't do, but uh, Kushal and Joyce and Matthew Stevens did for their PLOS genetics paper. Uh, and it illustrates uh, uh, just the idea of fitting a topic model to uh, single cell data. Um, and, and so again, we're, we're doing something similar. We have a sparse count, count matrix. Uh, actually, I stand corrected here. It's not very sparse, but but most of the single cell data sets are sparse. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a small uh, data set with only 259 cells. And here we're fitting a topic model with six topics. And, uh, you know, we don't, uh, even if you're not familiar with this data set, uh, you can kind of see that the topic models are aligning well with the, these labels. Here, uh, the labels are, are different stages of embryo development. Uh, and you can see that some of the uh, topics are, are capturing quite distinct uh, differences. And so uh, uh, 
almost like a cluster. So we see that with the orange topic, for example, and, and to some degree, the red topic. Another thing that's interesting about the topic model that makes it uh, useful is that if you have cells that aren't fully captured by one topic or, or another, uh, for example, the four cell um, uh, label or the, the um, four cell embryonic stage, it's, it's represented as a mixture of topics. So it's sort of in between different topics. And then uh, another thing to point out that makes uh, the topic model interesting um, is that sometimes it'll capture different types of patterns, not just uh, distinct uh, clusters, but also more continuous variation. And we see that with the blue and green topics uh, it, in the later stages. And I believe, you know, my, this is not my area of expertise, but I believe that, that at this stage in development, the cells actually separate into two different lineages. And, and so uh, the two different topics are capturing those lineages. Um, and also that's something that you can't know just by looking at the labels. You'd have to know a little bit more about the biology. And this uh, alludes to one of the challenges we face is how to interpret the topics. Okay, so this uh, uh, leads to the two questions that we tried to, uh, to tackle. Uh, in, uh, in applying topic models to, uh, to single cell data sets. Uh, one seems like it should be a very, uh, should already be answered. It's just how to, how to fit topic models fast to these large, potentially very large single cell data sets while also being accurate. And uh, we kind of thought that this was a solved problem. And you would sort of think, given the, the importance of the topic model in machine learning and, and also other areas, um, but uh, there was a paper that uh, Matt Taddy uh, presented at ICML, I guess it's a little while ago now, and he hinted at the problems uh, in terms of uh, fitting topic models um, that they might be slow to converge. And he proposed a solution, but it turns out his solution uh, didn't really help us very much, but uh, he did hint at the problem. What we'd like to do instead uh, is um, rather than reinvent the wheel, let's actually exploit the close connection between the topic model and another very important model in machine learning, uh, non-negative matrix factorization. And so we're, we're going to actually reuse the algorithms that have already been uh, developed for non-negative matrix factorization. And, and I'll, I'll uh, formalize that connection as well. A second, uh, also, I think very basic question is uh, how do we, um, well, how do we uh, interpret or annotate the different parts or topics that we're discovering? Um, and one way uh, to think about that in terms of uh, when we're working with single cell data is how do we identify the key genes or the distinctive genes? And, and if you're you know, working with text data instead, you might think about, well, how do we identify the keywords for a topic? So those two ideas are related to each other. Um, again, you would think that this has, has been tackled already, but we found that the, the approaches that are taken for text data sets don't really um, transfer over very well to the single cell state, uh, setting. Uh, and so uh, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to combine some, some very simple ideas um, from differential expression analysis and, and merge those together with ideas from topic modeling. I'll show that. Okay, let me just uh, see how we're doing. Okay, I hope you're all with me here. Um, oh, there was a question here about ordering left and right. I guess that's uh, relating to the structure plot. We're gonna see more structure plot, Asha, so um, maybe I can answer your question later on. Uh, and I think people can unmute themselves, right, Alex? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, again, no, no need to monitor the chat if it's, uh, if it's not sort of uh, easy for you to do that. I, I, I can do okay. that. I just happened. Yeah, I have it there now. So. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, be, I, I always leave this towards the end and then I forget to acknowledge people, but uh, a lot of people have contributed to, to this work. Uh, most notably, uh, Matthew Stevens, who has supported this throughout and has uh, always um, contributed ideas that are very uh, fundamental to, to this work. Okay, um, and also just point out that um, uh, 
the original idea comes from uh, the original ideas presented here are from a paper that I was not involved on, but is in plot genetics. Uh, but we also have an, uh, an archive preprint for some of these results. And we also have a couple packages, uh, count plus that was developed by, by Fouchel. And then we have a second generation of count plus uh, called past topic. And, uh, and all of the, uh, pretty much everything, no, I would say everything that I show here uh, is implemented in the fast topics package. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive in a little bit into a little bit more mathematical details. Uh, so we talked about the topic model, and I'd like to set it in the context of of uh, a couple other models and one in particular. Um, and this uh, I'm kind of inspired by. I always return to Barbara Engelhart's paper in, uh, from in published in Plus, Plus Genetics, uh, and the goal there was to uh, was to motivate a particular model, uh, but they also took this exercise of uh, connecting different um, models to each other. Uh, for example, uh, uh, PCA factor analysis, and and there actually they were working with count data as well, but a different type of count data. Uh, they were working with genotype data. Uh, so so we can apply a similar sort of, sort of exercise uh, to this setting here. Uh, so just to, to set the notation here, uh, we're thinking about uh, uh, look, uh, modeling the expected value of, of our counts, of our count data X, but the matrix uh, with rows being cells and uh, columns being genes. And so uh, this is your classic uh, low rank uh, factorization. And if you uh, then use a normal model, uh, you, know, you would get uh, either a principal component analysis or factor analysis. Uh, so that's perhaps the most basic model. And of course, you can model count data uh, with, with a normal model as well. Uh, so then if you then uh, think about uh, using a multinomial model instead, and you have to do uh, something a little bit different, you have to, to scale the expectations by the sizes of your, of your cells. Uh, you, you you can think about these as the sequencing depth. Uh, and then you get, uh, so you scale the, uh, the expectation. Uh, and, and then you have to impose a few constraints on your parameters. Then you get the top model. Uh, uh, some of those constraints being, for example, that the L's have to be topic proportions. So each row of your, of your L matrix, uh, each row being a cell or document has to sum to one. And then your, uh, uh, the columns of the F matrix. So these are the word frequencies or uh, Abhishek described these as being uh, relative expression levels. Uh, in the top of model, these have to represent probabilities uh, of, of sampling these genes or sampling words. And so the, each column has to sum to one. Okay, so that's uh, that's another way of thinking about the top of model. Um, and what I'll show in a moment is that, uh, and you might have intuited this already, is that the multinomial topic model is closely related to the Poisson model. And I think uh, Abhishek alluded to this connection as well. Uh, and so this, um, the Poisson formulation of uh, with of non-negative factorization actually goes back to the original paper on non-negative negative matrix factorization from uh, Lee and Xiang, uh, but it's not as widely used as, uh, as the one that's based on a normal model. Uh, but uh, yeah, but we're actually going to, to use some algorithms from this work. Okay, so now to formalize this connection a little bit better. Uh, so the idea here is that we have an L and an F for the topic model and L and an F for the Poisson NMF. And these are the expressions. Uh, they're quite simple. It's just a lin it's a, uh, just a simple transformation involving sums and, nor and, and scaling. Uh, so one thing to notice here is that if we start with the F from Poisson NMF, uh, all we have to do is, is uh, normalize the F and we get the, the word frequencies for the topic model. 
And then for the topic proportions, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, yeah. So there we go. Imagine coding that in R or Python and it'd be quite simple. Uh, and so, so then once we uh, make this transformation from the Poisson NMS to top model, or we could go the reverse, uh, the underlying uh, reason for doing this transformation is that uh, we get an equivalent in terms of likelihood. So if I uh, say, uh, if I have a likely, if I have a um, Poisson NMS model, uh, I can make the reparameterization to the topic model and we can recover the same likelihood. Uh, and then we have to add a few additional terms to account for the, the fact that the topic model is not uh, modeling the, the size, what we sometimes call the size factors or the document sizes. Uh, and let me just point out because you know we often go back and forth between the topic model, uh, sorry, and multinomial and Poisson and think about those as, some, some, as being related to each other. Uh, this is not an approximation. Sometimes people will, will make a Poisson approximation to the multinomial. Um, and, and there's a good reason to do that. But here, this is not an approximation. This is an exact, uh, uh, this is an equality. OK, and I feel like uh, I, I had to, to show the results from Fisher's paper from uh, it's the 100th anniversary of this paper. Uh, so Abhishek showed this earlier, but because it's the 100th anniversary, we, sh we should uh, present it again. Uh, so I, I think I'll skip this just in the interest of, of time of showing this in detail. But the point is that uh, this, this connection between the Poisson NMS and the multinomial topic model is based on, on this very basic result, uh, connecting the, the multinomial to the Poisson. And the idea is that these are the same process, it's just that one, the, the Poisson, is thinking about uh, N, is modeling N independent Poisson uh, variables, whereas the multinomial is conditioning then on, on a single Poisson variable representing the total size and then sampling condition on that. This, this one makes more sense to me. I think Abhishek had the multinomial on the left and the two Poissons on the right, and I wasn't sure if that was a typo or if I was just thinking about it wrong. But here, you, here you've written it in a way that is familiar for me. Yeah, sorry, that was a typo. Okay, cool, good. Oh, okay, I, I didn't notice that typo, okay. Okay, so no, no uh, typos here, as far as you can tell. Okay. Looks good to me. <laughs> okay, and, and just uh, notation-wise, um, here I use the pi for, for multinomial, uh, where I was using a lambda before, mm -hmm. uh, because the lambda here is for plus uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll, there you go. Um, if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, okay, so there's the connection that I briefly went over, uh, connecting plus NMS to uh, the topic model. And okay, so why are we interested in this connection? Well, what we're gonna try and do is See what happens if we then use an algorithm for Poisson NMS and use it to fit the topic model. And we'll see if that uh, helps us. Okay, so just a simple idea. We're just going to, to run an algorithm for a different model and then apply the transformation. Okay, so I'm gonna take the next few slides just to, to uh, go over uh, our understanding, our basic understanding of this optimization problem for Poisson NMS. Uh, so here, uh, similar to what we've seen before, we're, we're approximating uh, the expectation of X uh, of our count matrix by uh, a low, uh, uh, some low rank uh, approximation. Uh, so we have two matrices, um, L and F. And, and just to remind you, we're going to, uh, to take rows to mean cells and columns to mean genes. Okay. And and another piece of notation here, we're using uh, we're using L i to be a row of L, so it's going to be for a single uh, cell, and F j to be a single uh, a row of F, so it's going to be the the entries of F for a single gene. Okay. And then uh, and then the the expression here at the bottom. It uh, summarizes the optimization problem we're trying to, to tackle here. 
Uh, so we, it's a very simple objective function where we're trying to minimize uh, basically two terms. One is just a linear term and one that's uh, a term involving some logarithms. And, and the constraints are also uh, quite simple. We're just requiring uh, that L and F are non-negative. Is okay. there no so norming uh, uh, in the cost function? Is there no what? Is there no norming in the cost function? It's just the, the, the difference written in that way, I guess. Uh, there's, I'm not sure whether you're thinking about I it. I guess um, maybe, I, yeah, no, I just, I was just surprised to see there's no like squares or absolute values or anything. Yeah, so, so uh, right. So if, uh, maybe because you're more familiar with the, uh, uh, the non-negative matrix factorization where you have like the Frobenius norm. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I just think about this as you're, you're maximizing the likelihood. Uh, on, uh, these are, this is basically the, uh, if you replace L, the, the um, L times F, if you replace it with uh, you know, some parameter, this is just uh, the, uh, the, take the log of the plus L. Okay. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah. So you, this is, we're just doing maximum likelihood estimation of the L and F under uh, this uh, plus L model. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, so let me just uh, point out a few very basic, or a couple of very basic properties of the plus L NMS. I mean, it's, it's very basic, but I think it's also important uh, is that uh, it's, it's the plus L NMS objective is very well suited to sparse data. Um, so, uh, and that comes from two things. One is that uh, the, the, the log terms, if you have X's that are zero, then those terms disappear. Uh, so that's, that's a very simple observation. And the other important aspect here is that you can reorder the operations for the linear terms such that uh, you can compute that very quickly. Uh, you're just first computing some, some sums over cells and then uh, sums over genes and then uh, and multiplying those two together and then doing that over, over all the topics. Uh, yeah. So just, uh, so computationally speaking, it handles sparse data very well. Uh, the other uh, uh, very useful property is that um, if we uh, say, for example, we're only interested in optimizing the, the L matrix and we'll keep F fixed, then uh, the terms in the objective split up very nicely so that we can optimize separately a bunch of objectives uh, on their own. So in particular, uh, if we fix F, uh, here, I, I think I indicated in my slide, I was doing the opposite. Okay, so let me do what's in the slide here. I'm gonna fix L and we're gonna optimize F. So if I fix L, then we can optimize each row of F. Uh, so the F's for each gene separately. So it basically allows us to do massive parallelization. It's very simple. Uh, and so we can make these algorithms run very fast. And the other thing that this suggests is it suggests that we should do something like a, uh, an alternating minimization where we first fix L and optimize F and then uh, do the reverse. And so that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, we're gonna do an alternating minimization approach. And, and actually this is very reminiscent of the sorts of approaches that are done in Frobenius norm NMS, which you, uh, you may have seen before. We're gonna alternate between optimizing L and optimizing F. And so we get an algorithm that looks like this. Okay, so then the next question then is, well, how do we actually uh, optimize the rows of L and the rows of F? Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I might uh, just kind of go very briefly over a couple of slides so I can get to the some results. Um, but the idea here is that, uh, that this problem of fitting a row of L and a row of F is actually um, quite old. Uh, in fact, it's one of the uh, the, the early uses of uh, EM for uh, for fitting uh, a simple Poisson regression model. Uh, so just yeah, just to make that connection. So we can think about these algorithms as 
uh, we can kind of connect the dots between the algorithms. We have algorithms for the simple Poisson regression. We have algorithms for, for Poisson NMS, and we have algorithms for the topic model. And uh, and these algorithms are perhaps now that I've made these connections, it's perhaps not surprising that that they're uh, that they're either very similar or, or the same. Um, except there. Uh, you can also think about doing a simple coordinate descent algorithm, and there's no equivalent algorithm for doing that in top of model. Uh, and so that's uh, one thing that uh, apparently no one has tried before, surprisingly. Uh, so we're going to see what happens when we try running a coordinate descent algorithm. Um, and I, I, won't, it's, I won't go through the details of that algorithm, but just to point out that there are a couple papers that uh, presented this algorithm. Uh, and in fact, they're both the same. Uh, they di differ a little bit in the details. Uh, so Lynn and Boutros basically rediscovered the algorithm. And I believe that's in a B BMC bioinformatics paper. Okay, so let's see what happens when we apply uh, the EM and the CD variants of, of uh, these uh, alternating min minimization algorithms. And we're going to apply it uh, just to, you know, to let's apply it to a real single cell data set, not some toy data set. So we have uh, over 68,000 genes, uh, sorry, 68,000 cells, uh, and the data are quite sparse. And we're going to compare uh, these two algorithms, EM and the coordinate descent. Um, and we're also going to uh, use a, a technique that um, uh, was, uh, that is actually turns out to work very well for accelerating these, uh, these two uh, kind of block coordinate ascent steps. Uh, and, and it was used in a different context, but actually works very well here. Okay, so here um, we're so we're trying to fit, or we're trying to, to solve this optimization problem using these two algorithms. The blue is the EM, and the CD is is in red. And the two different uh, the, uh, the open circles are with extrapolation. And uh, and we're seeing we're trying to get uh, so I'm comparing distance to the best log likelihood we we've achieved. Uh, the log likelihood here is, is the objective we're also trying to minimize. Uh, and you can see that, uh, um, that to, to be honest, both algorithms seem to be approaching the same solution. Uh, the coordinate descent, however, does achieve, achieve the solution uh, much faster. Um, but uh, you know, overall, you know, if you're just a little bit more patient, there's not a huge benefit to, uh, to coordinate descent. Um, in this particular example, uh, where we're trying to fit a model with four topics. Uh, so now I'm going to run the top model again on the same uh, data set, the same uh, single cell data set, uh, and, uh, but with seven topics instead of four. And in this particular instance, uh, we have a very different uh, sort of result where um, uh, now uh, the coordinate descent with this extrapolation method gets a much, much better fit than, than any, of, any, any, any of the others. Uh, and uh, it's a bit weird because I, I'm showing this on the log scale. So I just, uh, and that was just to, to highlight the small differences, but uh, I just want to point out here that EM is still improving. Uh, so it is, it's just much slower than the, than the coordinate descent. Uh, so uh, yeah, so it's improving the fits, but it's gonna take a while uh, or I'm not sure when it will, we, we didn't wait long enough for it to get to the same solution. Uh, so this uh, is, this illustrates a situation where there may be a, a big benefit to using this uh, different algorithm. Uh, but there's still a question though, is this large difference in likelihood uh, from our point of view, is it actually giving us uh, different insights? Uh, you know, if you're, Fitting these topic models, you might find that there's lots of you know, very small differences, and so it won't really change your interpretation. Um, yeah, so let me uh, show you what the difference, uh, what the uh, solutions actually look like. The the key message here, uh, before we go on to the the next the, or the last idea of this talk, is that uh, these Poisson NMF algorithms do actually uh, lead to to differences not only in, in, in you know, quantitative differences, but also qualitative differences. We, get to, we see that we end up with, with uh, topics that, that 
lend themselves to a different interpretation. And you can see, for example, uh, the green topic here disappears uh, uh, when you get the, the better the, the better model fit. And uh, and there's some other differences if you look closely. Uh, okay, so let me uh, let me transition to the last idea. Uh, and that is about how to interpret these topics. Uh, so here we're going to borrow some very basic ideas from differential expression analysis. And I do mean basic. We're going to take a very simple Poisson model of expression. Uh, the SIs are the same as before. Those are the document sizes or the sequencing depth. And we're going to estimate uh, the, um, the, the relative expression levels uh, in each uh, for each cell i and for each gene j. And, and in the simplest case of differential expression, we just we can think about splitting the cells into two groups. And so we have two um, parameters we want to estimate. Uh, the the, the um, uh, sorry, two parameters for each gene, uh, whether depending on whether the cell belongs to the group or is not in the group. And then we can get your usual um, log full change estimate from these estimates of, of PJ1 and PJ2. Uh, so that's, that's just you know, kind of a recap of, of uh, a very simple differential expression analysis you could do. Uh, and, and there's a reason it's simple now because we're gonna make it a little bit more complicated in the next slide. And so now to, to make this model more flexible, we're going to adopt the idea from from topic modeling, where we're going to allow now uh, cells to have different grades of membership in different uh, groups or, or topics. And so that's captured by these L's, LIJ uh, represents the proportion uh, that, each, uh, that each cell is a, is a member for each topic K. Okay, uh, right, so that's, uh, so we call this uh, the grade of membership uh, differential expression. Uh, so there's one, uh, so, so there are a couple of difficulties that we run into when we try to do this. One is that uh, rather than just estimating two parameters, we have K unknowns that we have to estimate. And those potentially can be correlated uh, in uh, complicated ways. So uh, really what we want to achieve is a joint analysis over, uh, over all the, these unknowns. And then there's another question, which is how to formulate this, uh, the, the kind of conventional notion of log fold change. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip over the implementation details, how we, we actually uh, it, you know, implemented this on the computer. But uh, in terms of thinking about how to, uh, to, to come up with an equivalent log fold change in the setting, uh, the, the definition is here. Uh, but that's what the formal de definition looks, you know, I, I won't go through that because actually the idea is very simple. What we're doing is, is suppose you're interested in, in knowing the log fold change uh, for gene J in a, in a given topic K. We're gonna compare to all the other topics, and then we're gonna uh, keep the one that's uh, what we call the least extreme, uh, so the smallest log fold change. And the idea is that if we look across all the other uh, topics and, and the, small, the least extreme LC is still quite large, that means it's a very distinctive change that's happening not just between uh, two topics, but between all of them. Uh, so we, the idea is that that can isolate the the, uh, the most interesting genes. Uh, and, and there's a similar idea in in Kushal's and Joyce's paper and Plus Genetics. Uh, and so this, by borrowing ideas from differential expression analysis, we're, analysis, we're formalizing uh, this this notion. Okay, so uh, so this will basically be uh, um, the the last uh, slide before I wrap up just to illustrate this idea in a, a data set that you may be familiar with already. Um, it's not the same one as I showed earlier. It's a different CBMC data set uh, that was uh, from the same paper. Uh, and what's different about this data set is that we have the, uh, uh, in some sense, the, the ground truth. Um, it's not a perfect ground truth, but we have uh, uh, some no idea of what these cells might be from facts sorting. Uh, and so I, I've, I'm showing the different cell types here, uh, B cells, uh, myeloid cells, et cetera. And then the, the other cells are a little bit harder to distinguish the T cells and the natural killer cells. Um, but uh, so this, uh, so we have the labels coming from back sorting and then the topics are from our topic model. And you can see, for example, some of the topics align very closely with the cell types. 
like the blue topic is for B cells, uh, and uh, and the green topic is for uh, these CD4 plus uh, myeloid cells. Okay, so so we're going to use that then to just understand what this uh, grade of membership differential expression analysis is doing. Uh, so here's an illustration. Uh, I hope you're you can see the the genes the genes uh, labeled on this plot. So here's an example where we have some expectation what we should get. We sh we should be getting genes uh, that uh, the distinctive genes should be ones that uh, uh, are for uh, that are uh, in B cells. And indeed, uh, if you're if you're familiar with uh, biology of immune cells, um, you get uh, genes like CD seventy nine A, TCL one A, CD nineteen. Um, that show up on the right-hand side. So these are genes that show very strong least extreme uh, log fold change. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't get into detail how we do these posterior calculations. Um, the other thing is that we also get Z-scores um, uh, that uh, come from uh, uh, running adaptive shrinkage uh, after, uh, so it's a, after running, the, uh, well, we get the, these moderated posterior uh, estimates and the Z scores. And so uh, the Z scores, then the very high Z scores will be ones that are uh, you know, very strong evidence for differential expression. But typically, what we find is the interesting genes are, are ones that are showing up on the right hand side, uh, that they're strong enough that they're significant. Um, and, uh, but, but also, you know, very high log fold change. Um, and, and by significant, uh, we're measuring significance using these log, uh, sorry, not log full change, at the local false sign rate, uh, which you can think of as being sort of comparable to a, to a false discovery rate. Okay, uh, I think, um, yeah, let's, uh, maybe I'll just show one more slide and I'll stop there. Uh, so, so that was an example where, of course, we kind of knew what to expect. We knew that we were gonna pick out genes for, for B cells, uh, but what happens when we have a topic that we are not really sure what it could be? Uh, so here, an example of this is the pink topic where it shows up in all the cells. Uh, and, and so we were curious what, well, what it could be. And, and we can run the same sort of analysis, uh, despite the fact that uh, you know, no one cell is, is fully in that topic. And uh, what we find, um, perhaps not surprisingly, if you're familiar with this data set, is that we get a lot of ribosomal protein genes. Uh, so these, they're not very strong LFC, but they show up with uh, a very strong support uh, if measured by the Z-score or the lo local false sign rate. Um, and then we get some other interesting genes too. So this is maybe an example of something you might think of as unwanted variation. We're not particularly interested in these uh, ribosomal protein genes, but uh, it's useful to know what uh, pattern this is capturing. Okay, I'm going to stop there.